right. I never do think that thing's working. Um, amen. Praise the Lord. Well, another day in the presence of the Lord. Another day that the Lord has made, I will rejoice and be glad in it, in this day. Praise the Lord. First, first Wednesday, we did uh, dominion over yourself. Second week was last week, dominion over Satan, and I know... Uh, at least there's been a couple of folks. I hope there's been more than a couple, but I've heard of a couple of folks that, that this week have prayed on the whole armor of God. How many other folks have tried that? That was the sound of air going out of my balloon. <laughs> it ain't got nothing to do with high. It's got to do with all of them being up. Uh, it works. It works. Pray, 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 pray. It works. Pray on the whole armor of God. Go and read it in your Bible. Amen. This week, I think this applies to a lot of us. I think it, that this lesson tonight, uh, the, the message we have for tonight, I believe, uh, matter of fact, I know it affects everybody in here. So there's no free passes tonight. From the eldest to the youngest, it affects everybody that's in this place tonight. It's just about dealing with life. And all of us, if you're breathing, you deal with life. I don't care how much you isolate yourself, and I don't care how much you surround yourself by other people. I don't care your habits or whatever's going on, you're living. You can't deny it. Huh? Well, I don't, I don't know if I've ever preached a message that applied to everybody in the whole church. But this one does. Hey, man, I'm giving Brother Billy just a minute to get them handed out to everybody. A lot of room for notes. I didn't fill it in for you, though I could have. But I didn't fill it in for you. Uh, I know that Sister Lacey, for one, and there's a couple of others that like to uh, uh, take notes, and so I left you some space to take some notes. The scriptures and what have you, you're going to have to write them down. Is that all right? Praise the Lord. Well, yeah, my goodness. That ain't too bad. Did anybody not get one? Maybe a couple? Did nobody? Everybody got one that wants one? All right. That's 50, 50 again. That's all right. I may have to get me a new cartridge in that, in that copier over there. Amen. I'm going to stress this one more time. Probably he'll do it again and again and again and again and again. Uh, we've got to get to the point where everybody that's on board, everybody that's on board with us having a great revival. Let me tell you a funny story. Can I tell you all a funny story? In a way, it's sad. In a way, it's sad, but it's kind of funny. I have a preacher friend. Lives away from here a little bit. He's never preached here before, but hopefully we'll have him someday. But I was talking to him the other day, you know, about revival, Brother Billy, about great things. <laughs> Boy, I just feel the wrath of the pastor that busted loose when this, he's preaching revival and pushing revival and pushing growth and pushing we're going to bring in folks and we're going to have great revival we're going to see great growth and 
a young man stood up in his church and said, well, I thank the Lord for our little church. <laughs> and I don't remember every word he said, except I kind of like it this way and really don't want it to grow. <laughs> Boy, y'all would have probably had to get between me and him. I'd have been wanting to lay hands on him with the five-fold ministry. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. Them fighting days is over. Everybody but the devil. I'll fight for y'all. I will. I'll fight for you. But uh, we're going to grow. We're going to continue to grow. We won't stop. We will not stop. We had 31 men went to eat last night. 30 of those 31 have either attended this church all of their life, were raised in this church, or have just recently started attending occasionally. Only one didn't, and I understand that Brother Johnny preached to him all the way home, invited him to church, so who knows what might happen. So, uh, uh, And we had, we had six or eight that weren't able to go of the men in our church. And hey, let me tell you something. You get 40 men sold out. You better look out, devil. You better look out because, I mean, it was, it was just great, and, and it's just going to grow. It's gonna, we're going to grow as men and women, and that's, that's where we're at right now. If we keep doing what we're doing, souls are going to come in. But here's the important thing is that we keep growing, N not numerically, but that we keep growing, that the man of God may be perfect. Thoroughly furnished not to every good work. We got to keep growing, all right, as individuals. And this stuff that I'm preaching and teaching to you on Wednesday nights, when I hand you out a paper, I, I don't do that because we need to cut down some more trees. I do that to help you, all right? I do that for you to take with you and ponder on it, think on it, apply it to your life. Because everybody needs to apply every sermon Every time. Amen. This, this comes from the Dominion Bible study. This portion is written by Brother Mike Williams, the pastor of the Pentecostals of Apopka in Apopka, Florida. I took many of his notes, added some myself, rearranged a few things that I felt made it more applicable to our church. And this is having dominion. Everybody say dominion. dominion. That's a pretty way of saying we win. And having dominion over circumstances. Over circumstances. Circumstances de is defined as the way in which things have turned out. It's just the way it's happened. It's just the way it is. And I come to tell you tonight, you can have dominion over that. Right? Life. Number one, life, that's the whole human experience. And everybody that'll be honest with their self will say life has a time of laughter and a time of tears, time of pleasure and a time when it hurts, happy and sad. We win sometimes and we lose sometimes. We have our dreams come to pass sometimes and sometimes we have them slip away unrealized and lost. One, one thing's for certain. We like to say death and taxes, but the Bible says that those which are alive and remain are going to be called up, so everybody's not going to die, and there's a whole lot of folks that don't pay taxes, so that ain't the, for sure either. But the one thing that's for certain in life, one certainty, you can take it to the bank, one certainty in life is that life will be uncertain. Life will be diverse, Life will be unpredictable for always, for everyone, everywhere. Life will be marked by great heights and terrible lows. The mission of this message is to let us know that we do not have to be defined by those circumstances in our life. You do not have to be defined by your highest height 
nor your lowest low, we cannot allow those circumstances to define us. Something that is so fickle, life is so fickle. Life is just like the weather. Every day is a new day, and you really don't know what's going to happen. You show up at your job feeling good, everybody you work with is in a bad mood, and by lunch you hate everybody's guts. Can I get a witness? Okay, you just never know. You wake up, bounce out of the bed, go to sit down at the breakfast table ready to give your wife a big old smooch, and she pops you in the mouth and says, don't touch me. <laughs> and boom. Okay, life is unpredictable. We cannot allow something so fickle and so unpredictable to be the gauge by which our spiritual life is measured. We have got to quit living for God. Oh, I'm going to preach a minute. We've got to quit trying to live for God based upon what's going on around us at any particular time. We, our walk with God has got to be separated from this worldly life that we live. Okay? In the manner of how it affects us. And we've got to get to the place that we're not identified as an iron worker or as a teacher or as a nurse, but by that Christian who works for the hospital. All right? We got to be defined by who we are for him. We cannot allow life to define us. Because here's why. If you allow circumstances that are happening in your life. That's why people, oh my goodness, I've, I've preached and taught and yelled and, and screamed and hollered and shook and, and then just every time without exception, they come back to me and say, I wish I'd have listened to you. To stop people from making eternal decisions on temporary feelings. People want to make lifetime decisions on how they feel right this minute. Stop, wait, breathe, think. It's just a circumstance. It's just the way it is. It's like, you know, two people go out on three dates, you know, and they come up, we've decided we want to get married. No, you didn't. You decided you wanted to do things married people do. Okay, it's, a, it's just a feeling, Brother Billy, and it's going to go away. Okay, the highs, that high, my God, have mercy. That high feeling cannot always be replicated. So you live all your life trying to get back to where you were. You live all your life trying to recapture that one high moment. Okay, or the lows of life can and will be replicated especially as it becomes a way of life or what you feel like you deserve. When I'm going through a trial, going through something low, a big thing hammers me and knocks me down, and I become, I become identified with that, and I feel like that's what I deserve. And when I feel like that that's what I deserve, Brother McKinney, that means I've lost my vision, and the Bible tells us clearly where there's no vision, the people perish. If all I can see is myself staying down on the bottom of a, you know, scum on a cocoa can, that's all I'm going to be. You've lost your vision. Jesus said in John 16 and 33, These things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world, everybody say in the world. That's where I live. Say that, that's where I live. Okay. Sometimes some, uh, some folks seem like they're in another world, but they ain't. They're in our world, same world. In the world, you shall have tribulation. In the world, ye shall have problems. In the world, you will have highs and lows, ups and downs. You will be on an emotional roller coaster at some time in your life. But Jesus said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So troubles and trials are inevitable. We are instructed to not be depressed by that fact 
Because as Jesus was, so are we in the world. If we are filled with his spirit and remember that we have received power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon us. Paul said, 1 Corinthians 2 and 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. If our faith doesn't stand in the wisdom of men, including our own wisdom, then it goes without saying that if it's not standing in man's wisdom, it can't fall because of man's ignorance, including our own. Right? We will learn very quickly, if you don't hear anything else, I want you to hear me right now, there's a reason you got the Holy Ghost. It's to help you to respond in the right way. Okay, hear me right now. We will learn very quickly that we cannot control circumstances. People that to try to control circumstances end up in a place don't none of us want to be. Because you will go nuts trying to control and to adapt and change everything of every day. You cannot control circumstances. We must learn to control, now hear me right now, we must learn that we can control how we respond to circumstances. We control our response to everything. Say, well, I did it without thinking. That's not true. We control our response. Come on, y'all stay with me now. I feel the Holy Ghost wanting to help somebody in here tonight. Everybody's got this junk in our lives. Don't you want to learn how to have dominion, live in dominion over it? We control our response to everything. If somebody smarts off to you and you punch their lights out, you did it because you wanted to. Because you made a decision to. Okay? You make a decision to hug and kiss your kids when they go to school. It's a decision to do it. You make a decision to love your kids. And to love your family. You, you make a decision to stay committed to your family. Whether you feel it or not. We control how we respond to circumstances. Anybody have any questions about that? Before I move any further. We control our response. Okay? To all of life's circumstances. We are made up of three parts, body, mind, and spirit. The Bible tells us that, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now here's what it is, the three things. Our body is self-explanatory. It's the physical part of you. That's our body, our physical makeup. The second part is our mind, which is our soul. It's the mental part of a man. The will and the emotions that operate according to what they feel. Your senses. Okay? The third part is spirit. That's the part that knows God. To have the spirit of Christ in you or to have the Spirit of Christ working through you versus having the Spirit of the world, which the Bible refers to. And, I, and understand this is a little bit different. This is different than the 666 stuff and the mark of the beast. But the Bible calls it the Spirit of Antichrist, which is the opposite of the Spirit of Christ. Okay, that's our spirit. These three parts make us complete. When any one of these parts is attacked, whether it be your body, whether it be your soul, or whether it be your spirit, it affects the whole conglomeration. 
It is important that we learn to exercise the dominion that the Bible promises us in order to put a stop to the devil's plans. And I got a little side note here, and I nearly about got excited when I began to read it. It is amazing to think of the benefits of stopping him before he gets started. How many of you are sick and tired of spending all your life trying to react to what the devil's doing? If we follow after the Spirit, we will cut him off at the pass, so to speak. With, with the dominion that God desires that we have, we can stop the devil before he gets started. The Bible tells us plainly, and I don't have this in my notes, but the Bible tells us plainly, we are not ignorant of his devices. The devil, he's pretty slick, but he uses the same old junk. Let me tell you something, I came in here this morning to pray, and as soon as my, heat, my knees hit the floor right there, Brother Billy, I felt the power of the Holy Ghost just like whoosh. And all I could think, Brother Terry, is it's Wednesday. Praise God, it's Wednesday. We get to have church again. We get to come together again. We've got to apply this stuff to our lives. We've got to apply this stuff to our lives, and we'll stop dragging the devil around with us. We'll stop dragging the hell we go through every day around with us because we will have dominion over it. Yeah. Faith has got to rise up in here. And you got to, because all everybody thinks, we've even schooled ourselves to think, well, I can't control that. I can't control that. You're right, we can't. It's just life. You can wash your kids' hands. You can scrub down their bed. You can spray Lysol from the front to the back. But there's a good chance they're going to get a cold anyway. I did everything I could. Okay. Okay, you did. Good job. They got sick anyway. Now you can decide to just keep on purifying and let them ride it out. Or you can curl up, suck your thumb, go to bed, pull up your little dolly, and just lay there and cry because it didn't work out for me. No, he, ain't, he don't bother me. Them kids may have some lungs, but they can't outshout me. They don't, none of them bother me. Do y'all feel what I'm saying tonight? You may do every, God help me right now. Come on, Holy Ghost. You may be trying to do everything right. And it looks like ain't none of it working. You still decide how you respond to that. And that, my friends, is the difference in you ruling a situation or it ruling you. It's, it's not what it does to you, it's how you respond to it. The third thing, power. I'm talking about dominion over circumstances. Luke 10 and 19, we also used this last week. Luke 10 and 19. Behold, you don't have a paper? No, it's a new paper. You got one? Go back there on the copier. There's one right on laying on top of the copier. I know you like to take notes and follow along too. Luke 10 and 19. Behold, I give. Unto you, power. I'm going to read that one more time because I, I explained that for you last week. I hope you guys got a hold of it. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. All right. Lesson from last week. Who remembers it? Where does that power come from? Acts 1 and 8, Brother David, the, the power he gives us comes from the Holy Ghost. You're not going to get it any other way. You've got to get it through the Spirit. Because the devil does not recognize somebody that tries to fight him without the Spirit. That's what happened to the seven sons of Siva. They said, we adjure you to a demoniac. 
They said, basically, we cast you out in the name of Jesus whom Paul preacheth. The devil said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but I don't know you. And then he kicked their behind, took up all their clothes, and they had to run out of the house naked, whooped all seven of them. Naked and wounded. Okay, you've got to have the Holy Ghost to have this power. That's why everywhere we go, everyone we meet, everybody we talk to, we got to tell them about the Holy Ghost. It's the difference maker. It's the difference maker. It's the Spirit of God. Notice this. What's a major word you see in that passage of Scripture that's repeated? It's in there two times. Power. Now, I've told you this many times, and I'm going to keep telling you. There can be many Greek words translated into the same English word. Okay? So you can read it. That's why it's important that you get some books and stuff. Use the internet. Use Bible studies and Bible dictionaries and study this stuff. It's important to know what the Bible's saying. Okay? Because these two word power are derived from two different Greek words. But they're both translated power. Y'all hang with me a little bit. One is the one that's given to us by God. And one is the power of the enemy. Now the first power comes from the Greek word exousia. E-X-O-U-S-I-A which means authority. The second power comes from the Greek word dunamis, which means or suggests ability. So, Satan, who is our enemy, has the ability to oppress us, depress us, attack our lives, attack our families through circumstances, through stuff that happens in life. But through the gift of power, which you receive, as Brother David's already shared with us, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. We have authority over his ability. We have dominion over his attacks. And this faith in the power of God determines our response to circumstances. Your faith in the power that is within you. That whatever I'm going through right now, I'm either going to die from it and get to be with Jesus or I'm winning. It will not defeat me. Come on, y'all stay with me now. My goodness. Do you want to win? Are you tired of losing? Do you not want to ever be defeated again? I'm telling you how to do it tonight. Brother Booby, it works. It works. Brother Dole, it works. We determine our destiny by how we respond to circumstances. That's why they got so frustrated with Jesus. They spit on him, slapped him, beat on him, called him ugly names, called him a liar, called him a blasphemer. He didn't do nothing. And the Bible tells us, Sister Maria, in Hebrews chapter number 12, that he despised the shame. Does it not say that? Oh, I tell you what, I might have to do this again next Wednesday. I'm practicing tonight. Brother Billy, he despised what he was going through. He wasn't sitting there enjoying it. He despised the embarrassment of it, the shame of it. Because Brother Robbie, he knew in his heart who he was. And he told Peter, remember this, he told Peter, I can call down 12 legions of angels right now. They'll, they'll fight for me. That was a fact, Brother Pete. 
it could have happened. He despised the shame because the flesh, he was fully God. And the flesh does not like circumstances. That's why, Brother Billy, I remember a, point, a comment you made one time. We, the way that we generally respond to, to circumstances is fight or flight. Remember that? We fight back or we run. But I've said this before and I'll say it again. The way that you live in dominion, remember, remember the wisdom of God is what? What is it to the world? Foolishness. The wisdom of the Holy Ghost is foolishness to the world. This is the stuff you do, okay? When you're being led by the Spirit. Now, I know Roger's not here tonight, but I would tell it if he was here. He's got some sickness in his family and stuff, but they, they, they're coming back. He went to... He went to his other, met with his other church. He's afraid he got in trouble because he took too long a lunch break. He went to the other church where he came from, turned his keys back into him, resigned every one of his positions, and said, I'm going to New Madrid. I never tried to, I never begged him to come over here. I never once asked him to come over here. But he went to the hospital this morning to, to get a charger. His dog ate his phone charger up. He was home with a sick little girl. He went to the hospital. Well, y'all fix and see why we need new converts. Fix and see why we need new converts. Two weeks ago, somebody broke into his shop and stole all kinds of stuff, including an expensive pressure washer that was borrowed. Is that not true? He had borrowed a pressure washer, and one of the guys he was trying to help broke into his shed and stole all his stuff to sell it for dope. Well, when he gets to the hospital today, his mother works there. And did he tell you this story? His mother works there, and she said, guess who's in here? Said who? Said Moonbeam. That's his name. Probably a nickname. Moonbeam. Guess who Moonbeam is? The guy that stole his stuff from him. And Roger's mama said, won't you come pray for him? And he said, my flesh want to go back there and knock him out. He stole my stuff. He did me wrong while I was trying to help him. Now listen to me. The Lord's working, saints. The Lord's working. So he goes in there, Brother Dole, and prays for that rascal. That ain't the good part. He prays for that rascal because it's a mental deal. And he told him, he said, they're going to send you away to get you some help. When you come back, you come find me, and we're going to start over fresh. But it's one of those poor people rooms, I call them. I hate them. We've been in them before. There ought not be no double room in the hospital. Some of you nurses, y'all put that in your suggestion box next time. I hate them. But it's a double barrel room. Y'all know what I'm talking about. It's got a curtain slides in between them. I can't stand them. Anyway, the curtain is drawn. There's a lady laying in the bed in there. She hears him praying. She said, hey. He said, what? She said, you sound like a preacher. So he walked over and he said, no, ma'am, I'm not a preacher. I'm just serving. I'm trying to help. She said, well, would you pray for me too? So he said, what's wrong with you? She said, every year at this time, around Thanksgiving, I have a breakdown because several years ago in Chicago, I was sitting with my sister in the living room and she got her brains blown out and they scattered all over my, my living room wall and I can't deal with it. She's in there because she's contemplating suicide. I mean, she's in a mental war. And so he began to pray the prayer of faith over her. It all started because he went and prayed for somebody who did him wrong. He began to pray the prayer of faith over her, and he said before he knew it, the Holy Ghost had broke him, and he's squalling and bawling and crying over top of this lady. Turns out, She's his neighbor. Yeah. 
So he said, when you get home, just come around the corner. That's where I live. Let me tell you something. We need a van for our church. I'm fixing to buy that rascal a van, let him fill it up and bring people to church down here all the time. Huh? Hey, the Lord is working, but he works when we do something that's stupid in the eyes of the world because the Holy Ghost says to, that's when God says, now I'm getting you where I can work through you because God's wisdom is foolishness to the world. You can't do that. You can't do that. Oh, yes, I can. I don't want to. But I'm not governed by me no more. I'm governed by, oh God, help me right now. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they shall be called the sons of God. It's how you... That's having dominion over circumstances through the Holy Ghost. You can't do it by yourself. We've got to lean on the everlasting arms of God. Psalm 91. I remember Brother David taught us a wonderful lesson out of Psalm 91. I'm not going to hit all of it. I may have him do it again real soon. Beautiful lesson. There are four things that describe the state or the status of those that are godly, those that are in the will of God. The first one is the secret place of the Most High. There's a secret place you can go and be with the Lord. That secret place is always there, even when circumstances are coming against you. God is a refuge a fortress, a hiding place for the righteous. It's in Psalm 91. You can find it. And he also talks about deliverance through divine protection. In the process of revealing to us the blessed state of the godly, we are given four unique threats in Psalm 91 that we must be aware of. The first is the terror by night. The second is the arrow that flieth by day. The third is the pestilence that walketh in darkness. And the fourth is the destruction that wasteth at noonday. Somebody tell me what it looks like outside at noon. It's at its zenith. It is the brightest time of the day. There are many things to be said of these four things, but I'd like for the sake of this study to focus on number four. Remember, we're talking about dominion over circumstances. One of the most vulnerable times, and this is so important to this church right now, we are riding high, okay? The Holy Ghost is moving. The Holy Ghost is changing people. I'm believing somebody be filled with the Holy Ghost tonight. Hey, I'm talking to people miles away from us that are getting emotional. They, they're reading everything on Facebook, watching every video on Facebook. They're remembering words I said as I was baptizing people. Somebody asked me today, what in the world are y'all doing down there? I said, nothing. But the Lord's gone nuts. Huh? Mm. Noonday refers to a time when the sun is at its peak. It's the brightest part of the day. The circumstance I'm going to deal with right now is the circumstance of success. The warning is for the complacency that is sure to come from resting on your laurels, so to speak. There is a fleshly desire when you climb a mountain to sit down and rest. That is a time when you're at your most vulnerable to the enemy. Is in the afterglow. The, the brightest time of the day when you're walking in high cotton, so to speak. 
when you are flushed with the thrill of a success. Psalm 91, 3, 5, and 6, taking part of each of the verse, says, Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. There's a wonderful illustration in the book of Judges about the peril of success. But the key... The key to this, uh, to not to not fall and pray and having dominion over the circumstance of success uh, is that we must have uh, the glory to be of God and not of ourselves. When He is glorified in what He's doing in our lives, uh, we are in fact exercising dominion over our circumstances uh, by putting the credit in the proper place uh, and having a proper perspective of them of having a proper perspective of success. And I put in little quotes, uh, we should never forget and always be quick to say when somebody says, boy, you're doing good. We should always be quick to remember, but you should have seen me when he found me. You should have seen me when he drug me out of the gutter. You should have seen me in my mental state when he reached down and got a hold of me. We can never forget, never forget, and it's a cliche, we can never forget, but for the grace of God, there goes I. But for the grace of God, we cannot rest on our laurels, church. I have felt led in the Holy Ghost uh, several times to say it, and I will continue to say it. We are riding good right now, but we're still not back where we used to be. We're doing really good, but I'm not resting. We're not going to stop praying on Monday nights. We're not going to stop coming to church early and pray. There wasn't as many in the prayer room tonight as there has been being. Can't let it stop, saints. Reason why I was so overwhelmed, Brother David, when I came in this morning and my knees hit the floor as I enter his gates with thanksgiving and in his courts with praise, don't ever stop the praying through the tabernacle or at least praying through a pattern that keeps you focused. The reason why, Brother Terry, that I was so overwhelmed and I did begin to feel the power of God is because yesterday when I prayed, it was work the whole time. I think sometimes, Brother Dole, I think sometimes that he just backs away from us and watches. He's still with us, but I think he just watches. Are you just all about feeling and all about emotion? Or are you committed? Huh? Because if I knelt down every time and I felt his presence as soon as I hit the floor, there would be a tendency in me to say, man, I don't really need to stay down here at long today. I'm already in the feeling the presence of the Lord. I think I'm going to go on about my rat killing. So we've got to stay focused. We cannot let success, we cannot let some new converts, and Lord knows I'm thankful for them. I reenact it in my mind all the time. Seeing them filled with the Holy Ghost, seeing them renewed. I thank the Lord for it. I call your names out every day in prayer that you can be strong today. But I'm not satisfied. Sister Casey put it on her Facebook page. I said it at our installation service. We won't stop till the whole world knows. We can't stop until the whole world knows. Sister Margaret, I kind of feel like you. If I run into the president, I believe I could testify to him. I feel like, and you know what, Brother Pete? I I realized it today, and I probably should have stopped my truck and run around the highway when I realized, Brother Wimpy, anybody that wants it can have the Holy Ghost. Anybody that wants it can have it. The ones we think's the furthest from it, The one you're thinking about giving up hope on, pray for him one more day. (laughs) Boy, 
Y'all better be glad that I got dominion over circumstances because I got enough stuff to keep y'all here till midnight. And I'm feeling the Holy Ghost so strong working in this. You can win. You can make it. You can live in dominion. I'm not talking about, and Brother Robbie will appreciate this, I'm not talking about just winning a skirmish here or there. But I'm talking about being victorious. I'm talking about going to a time when the enemy has to give up. And go looking for something else. When the enemy fails to conquer us, verse 5, I mean point number 5, when the enemy fails to conquer us with success, he turns to trouble and trials. 1 Peter 4 and 12 said, Beloved, you should shout when you see that in the Bible. Beloved, thank, oh, thank it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. When you're going through a trial, when you're going through a problem, when you're going through a test, when it looks like all hell literally has come against you, don't get worried. Don't think it's weird. Don't think it's strange. And bless God, do not think that you're doing wrong because everything's coming against you. Don't think being a Christian automatically brings a trouble-free life. A life that's free from opposition and days without difficulty. Because if this is what you think, you'll be disappointed. This illusion leads to disillusion, which leads Brother Billy to discouragement. We can, however, live under the open heaven of God's promises. Romans 8, 37 through 39 says, But nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And his love for me, nothing can take it away. You can't be bad enough that God won't love you no more. But brother David, God commendeth his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. 2 Corinthians 2 and 14 says... I might get done. Now thanks be unto God, which always, everybody say always, always, causeth us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor. Y'all know what that word means? The savor. It's a enjoyment, the pleasure. It's like Brother Pete when we sit down there first and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and then they flop one of them big old fillets down on our plate. No, I'm, I'm serious. And you break it open, Brother Terry, and the steam fogs your glasses up. And your mouth starts watering. It happens. And then you, it gets cool enough for you to take that first bite Boy, and you just savor it. You savor it. You want to go nuts on it, but it's, it's, it's not time for that. That's coming down the road, but you just enjoy. It's, it's when you've been out on the, when you've been in the cotton field and you had a long row. I never went in the cotton field, but I've been in the bean field. And them rows look like they're a gazillion miles long. And when you get to the end, and you dip that dipper down in the jug, or you push the button, everybody shares the same cup, and didn't everybody get all upset about it? Ain't that something? And you that first cold trickle of water that goes, oh, man, that's almost like heaven. And that's savoring it. 
and make manifest the savor of his knowledge by us. My Lord. Brother Terry, when I read that, it was just it was just like that I crawled up on his lap and he wrapped a big old afghan around me. Just like when I was a little boy and I did that with my grandma. And she got one of those afghans around me. Made me a cup of cocoa in these plastic cups that was about that tall. They had white on the bottom and red, I mean, white on the top and red on the bottom. Had a handle. See, mama and them was looking at me all crazy because they didn't get treated like that. <laughs> I felt when I read of his knowledge by us in every place, I can't leave the place of victory as long as I'm with him. Every place. Now, thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. Now, hear me right now, and I'm about to let you go. I got to get one more really good point, though. Think about this just for always causeth us to triumph in Christ. The things that the devil attacks us with have nothing to do with our salvation. He can't touch it. He cannot touch your salvation. He cannot touch your walk with God. He cannot get into that place that's just secret between you and the Lord. So he tries to, do you see the importance for us to live in dominion over circumstances? That's all he can use. It's problems and junk in our life or success. That's all he can use is circumstances. But if we have the knowledge of the Lord's got his eye on us wherever we are and he causeth us always to triumph, he can't let the devil win. It's impossible for the devil to win. You say, well, I don't know if I believe that. Well, if that's the case, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. He, he that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, I will liken unto him to a man that built his house upon the sand. And the winds came, and the rain blew, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. But I will liken him that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them to a man that built his house on a rock. And the winds came... And the waves battered it, uh, and the rains came, uh, and the lightning struck, but it stood. It stood. That's what I'm talking about, having dominion. Having dominion over circumstances. Verse number, part number six. I only got two parts left. I got 30 minutes to get it done in. Isaiah 40, 29 through 31 says, He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, that means no ability on your own, he increases strength. Did you know that when you are at your weakest physically, you are at your strongest in Christ Jesus? Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. So your vigor and your strength and your vitality will not hold up against the enemy. Your smartness won't profit you nothing against the enemy. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Now, the Hebrew translation of weight has a very graphic, definitive meaning. The origin of our word weight has the connotation of something weak being wrapped around something strong in order to gain strength. For example, you take a piece of thread, piece of thread that you sew a button on, 
and you tie it to the back of a pickup truck to pull somebody out of a ditch. And that thread's probably going to snap while you're tying the knot, right? But if you take a chain, a big fat logging chain, and you wrap that thread around that chain and wrap it and wrap it and wrap it around that chain, and then you hook the chain and the thread to a truck to pull it out, you can, in fact, say, I pulled the truck out with a piece of thread. Huh? What the scripture is telling us is they that wait upon the Lord is telling us to wrap ourselves around him. Wrap ourselves around God. Until, Brother Billy, we're not relying upon our strength, but on his. So whether abounding or abased, experiencing success or failure, winning or losing with regard to circumstances, as long as we're hooked together with Jesus, we're destined to win. So what I have to tell you is how do you wrap yourself around the Lord? 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 1 says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. First thing is pray. Come early to pray before church. Come to Monday night prayer. Pray an hour in the monthly prayer chain. Pray every morning before you start your day. I got to let you know something. For a revival church and somebody that wants to be in dominion over circumstances, prayerlessness is not an option. It is not an option to not pray. If you've got to give up eating in order to pray, pray. You cannot be so busy that you can't pray. The new converts, if you want to make it, learn to pray. Learn to pray. Acts 2 and 42, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. They continued steadfastly, steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. It's important, Brother Billy, that we have right doctrine and we have right fellowship. It's important that you don't run with a bunch of negative folks. I don't care if they're church folks or not. If they're negative all the time, don't run with them. It's important that we do our best to surround ourselves by positive influence. Holy Ghost-filled people, talk to them on the phone. Talk to them on Facebook. Text back and forth with them. But do your best to surround yourself. Everything the church has, go to it. Say, well, I don't like to go to it. Go anyway. I'm a big dummy. I really don't like to do nothing. If you want to know the truth. Oh, it is. I don't like to do nothing except what I want to do. Some of y'all's the same way. But I can't tell you. It's probably been close to a million times, Brother Pete. Not really a million, but probably several hundred thousand because I've been this way a long time. That I didn't want to go. But because it was the right thing to do, I went. And when I got there, I didn't want to, didn't want to leave. It's important. It's important. Hebrews 10 and 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Go to every church service you can find to go to. Even trick the pastor into thinking you believe they're going to get women go to the fish cook-up. They can't. But she's going to save her making me look like a dummy for a long time. <laughs> Sister Connie texted me last night. When I was sitting there not long from getting ready to go, about 4.30. And Brother McKinney had said, what time are we leaving? <laughs> it wasn't funny. <laughs> it wasn't funny at all. I didn't know what to do. 
I sat there looking at it. And looking at it. And here's what I thought. I thought, she didn't catch that it was just for the men. Now what do I tell her? And I sat there. And I sat there. Boy, I was worried. I mean, I was speechless. I had nothing to say. No, no options. Nothing. I had to come this morning and pray 12 hours for wisdom. Because it all went away. So I did the smartest thing any husband can ever do. I said, baby, come here. I really did, didn't I? I said, will you call Connie and fix this? Well, she looked at me like I was a dummy, but I was really feeling like one because I didn't know what, what I do. I'm fixing to make this woman mad, <laughs> feelings hurt, and I'm the big dummy that don't know how to announce nothing right. And then Amanda called her. It sounded like a hen laying <laughs> eggs when she answered the phone. Dying laughing. It wasn't funny. I ain't been got like that in a long time. So, her friends at work told her, they said, you're going to have to tell him to baptize you again because it didn't take the first time. I told her, I said, you don't want me baptizing you again. Because that may take a while to come up. She got me. I didn't know she had it in her. What do you do now? Oh, I do now. <laughs> Let's all stand. That's one circumstance I still ain't got dominion over. But I'm working on it. It was funny. <laughs>